Hello guys, um, it's Thomas Grotto here. You can see my picture, but you cannot see me because I don't want to turn on my camera. In this video, I want to go over the review slides for the final exam. The slides are on Moodle, right? You can download the slides, but in case you want to uh, hear my voice explaining some things on the slides, you can follow this video. But basically, I'm just going to cover what um, is already on the PowerPoint, okay? So, so this review lecture is for the, the, the final exam. The final exam is going to have questions about time series and panel data models. Um, so I have divided this lecture into three parts. The first one is about uh, just showing you, again, it's just a review. What is the difference between cross-section, time series, and panel data? Okay, before we see the models, what is the difference in terms of the data structure? Um, then I'm going to go over the time series models and I'm going to compare them. And then finally, I'm going to compare and contrast the panel data models. Uh, just one important note the exam is this, okay? This, the, the exam is exactly about this compare and contrast the different models, the different time series models and the different panel data models. Um, that's what you have to do. You have to understand what each model does and what is the, the, you know, what are the similarities and differences between one model and the other. And, you know, which model would you choose under, you know, this scenario? That's what I'm going to ask in the exam. You know, you have, you know, this is happening. Which model, which model would you prefer? Um, and why, of course, you have to explain why you're choosing a a specific model, okay? Um, so let's take a look at the structure of the data first. What is the difference? So I'm going to start with cross-sectional data. Um, so different variables on different individuals for the same year, okay? The crucial, uh, the crucial word here is same, same year. Um, so it looks like this. This is cross-section, okay? That's what you learn in in Applied QE, uh, yeah, quantitative economics, applied quantitative economics, um, in econometrics, uh, cross-section, right? So each observation, each row is a different, you can call it individual or country or group, okay? I'm going to call it individual, okay? So each country here is an individual. That's the language that I'm going to use. So here... For example, in this data set, we have 61 observations. Each observation is a country, okay? So these are the individuals. And for each country, we have different variables, okay? So these are different variables. So each country, you can see the name of the country, the number of the observation, and then one variable, sorry, uh, you have multiple variables for each single country, okay? So there is no time here because we are looking at different individuals, different variables on these different individuals, but all for the same year. So there is no time dimension, okay? This is cross-sectional. Another example is this one. Um, so here we have more observations. We have 526 observations. Um, so we have the wage, we have the educational level, probably this is in years. Uh, years of experience, and here I'm. Uh, this, these are just dummy variables, okay? One for married, one uh, if it is a woman. So cross section again, okay? And then you have to decide what is the endogenous variable. Probably somebody would just run a cross sectional regression with wage on the left hand side, and then years of education, years of experience, uh, and the dummy variables on the right hand side, okay? Um, next, time series data. Um, so what is the difference? Well, now we have variables on the same individual over time. And the keyword here is same, but same individual, okay? Remember, for cross-section, it's the same time period, okay? Same time period. And now we have multiple periods, but it's the same individual. So time series usually look like this. So we have lots of observations, and each observation is for the same individual, 
so each observation is for the same individual but each observation is for a different time period in this case it's an year but it could be like an hour it could be a day it could be a month a quarter uh, a decade it doesn't matter okay what matters is each row each different row is uh, it's a different time period for the same individual okay and then you have multiple variables that are um, organized uh, over time okay so each row is not in an individual everything here is about the same individual an individual could be a person it could be a household it could be a country it could be a state a county um, yeah whatever you want okay so now the rows are the the time periods in this case these are the years okay um, then we have pooled cross-sectional data okay pooled cross-section so this is not panel okay don't fall into this trap this is not panel data it looks like panel data but it's not panel data okay why the keyword is there it's highlighted in red because now we have multiple cross sections over time and then you hear this and say oh you know you have multiple cross sections over time so i have panel data and that is not correct okay the fact that you have multiple cross sections over time does not mean that you have uh, panel data okay because in this case you have independent cross sections over time so you don't have panel data because if the cross sections that are over time are independent of each other you don't have panel data okay so it's written there this is not panel data why because the data that is displayed over time are not about the same individuals okay so the data is basically so what we have is so here again so we ha you have the observations here you see the years and we are stacking the data so you can call it you know you're stacking the data or you're pulling the data that's the more technical term to pull the data notice here you have all these observations and then you have the same year you see up to here and after you know you have 250 observations for this year 1993 but after that you have observations for 1995 so the first 250 observations are for this year the same year so this is a cross-section you see this is a cross-section because you have 250 uh, let's say individuals for the same year 1993 up to here and then you have multiple variables so you have multiple variables for different individuals for the same year up to here so this first part here is a cross-section but then in the bottom I mean in the second half you have another cross-section so you have 250 individuals here okay for another year 1995 and then you have the same variables again so you're basically pulling the data together you're just stacking them okay um, but these individuals here are not the same as here so that's why this is not panel data because you don't know if they are the same okay and if and if there is no reason to believe they are the same they're not the same so and you cannot treat them treat them as if they were the same so this is not panel data you're just pulling the data okay you have one cross section here and another cross section here for a different year okay this is pulled OLS sorry you can use sorry you can use the pooled OLS model here um, this is not you are not using a panel model here okay so let's see what panel data is okay so panel data is when you have cross-sectional data over time but for the same individuals and that word that is highlighted there same same individuals is crucial okay the same cross-sectional units or individuals you can call it the units or individuals are followed over time okay so panel data actually looks like this um, so what do you see here okay you have 300 rows 
and you have different cities. You could have the name of the cities here, but you don't. So instead of the names of the cities, you have, let's say, the city code, okay? So city one is one city, city two is another city, so you know, this could be like Manchester, two is London, and here is, I don't know, Liverpool, okay? So instead of having the names here, we have like numbers. So what happens is, you see, and then years. You see, we're, we, are, we have data for the same city, the same cities here, for different years, and then different variables. So we have multiple, multiple variables for different years, for the same city, and then multiple cities. This is panel data. Because when the data is structured like this, we know that we are observing these multiple variables over time and we know it's about the same cities okay the same cities and this is how the data is organized okay you have one city here and then all the years here's just two okay but it could be like way more it could be like whatever 100 years or months or days or oh sorry um but basically here we're just observing the same city over two years, 1986 and 1990. You see, then 1986, 1990, 1986, 1990. But if we had like more years, they would be here, right? So you're stacking them. So if you have data like this, then you can use a panel, a panel model, like fixed effects or, or random effects. Sorry, guys, I'm, my nose is blocked. <laughs> um, so... Let's take a look at the time series models, okay, and compare them. So first, first thing that you have to do, you have to check for unit roots, okay? That's the first thing that you do. Well, you plot the data, you know, you plot the data, then you have an idea of the data. Then you have to do the unit root tests. You do the augmented Dickey Fuller test. And remember, every time that you test something, the first question that you have to ask yourself is, what is the null hypothesis, okay? For the ADF test, augmented Dick Fuller, the null hypothesis is the series has a unit root. Okay? When you do the Philips Perron test, the null hypothesis is the same. Okay? ADF and PP, they have the same null hypothesis. Because when you see the p-value, you only know what the p-value means if you know what the null hypothesis is. Okay? Don't look at the p-value if you're not sure about the the, the null hypothesis, okay? Every time that, that you do a test, could be like an LM test, the Lagrange multiplier test, it doesn't matter. An F test, a T test, you always look, first thing that you do, you look at the null hypothesis. If you have not understood the null hypothesis, you're not going to understand the, the p-value, okay? Trust me. So, and then we have the, uh, the Kiwatoski, I forgot the names of the guys. Um, I remember the first one, just Kiwatowski. So the uh, KPSS test, the null hypothesis is the opposite now, okay? The series uh, does not have a unit root, okay? So we use the last one as a cross-check for the other two, okay? Then you look at the p-value, okay? So I prefer to use, I don't use the 10% threshold, I use the 5%, okay? So if the p-value is lower than 5%, then you reject the, the null hypothesis, okay? Um, and remember, in econometrics, you cannot say that you accept the null hypothesis. You never accept a hypothesis. You fail to reject it, okay? Because in the end, folks, science, and that includes um, econometrics, science does not prove anything, okay? Science does not prove anything, and, and econometrics doesn't prove anything. What econometrics does is it can reject hypothesis or fail to reject but you cannot accept a hypothesis okay this is very important this is about the philosophy of science okay uh, the purpose of science is not to prove something the purpose is, the purpose of science is to come up with let's say disprovable falsifiable claims hypothesis and then we check if we can uh, disprove them but you cannot prove them Okay, you cannot prove that something is true. You cannot. You can only. Uh, you can only. Sh uh, you know, come up with evidence to show that they are not true. 
So don't say accept. You say you don't reject or you reject. Okay. Uh, not rejecting is not equivalent to accepting. Um, and then you have to check for cointegration. Here I'm just supposing that you have two time series. Okay. But you can do this for three, four, five. But I'm supposing you only have two. So the Johansson test has two uh, test statistics, the trace test and the eigenvalue test. Um, the no hypothesis is the same. Okay, it's, it means the series are not cointegrated. So R, R is the number of um, cointegration relationships. Okay, the no hypothesis is, is, is that R is zero, which means they are not cointegrated. Okay, and then you check the p-value. If the p-value is less, lower than, than 5%, then you can reject that R is 0, which means R is 1. Well, yeah, in the sense that I told you, it's you, you reject the R is 0, then you go to the next, okay? And this works for if you have two time series, because if you have three time series, R could you can even reject that R is 1, which means that R is 2, okay? Because if you have three time series, you could have two cointegration relationships. So then you can reject that R is zero, and then you go to R is one. And then you reject that uh, R is one, so then you go to R is two. But in this case, I'm just supposing that you have two time series, okay? So, yeah, so if you reject the no hypothesis, it means that you have evidence of cointegration, okay? Um, remember, again, the same here, always, you do the Johansson test, the first thing that you ask yourself is, what is the null hypothesis? Okay, don't look at the p-value if you have not already understood what the null hypothesis is, okay? You're never going to understand the p-value if you don't understand the null hypothesis, because this is how you reject the null hypothesis. Because if you get confused here, uh, you're going to screw up everything. Um, so let's move on. So our, our first basic time series model is the ARIMA model, okay? ARIMA stands for Autoregressive Integrated Moving Average model. It has only one variable, okay? Just one variable. Uh, the variable is regressed on itself, on its own past values. It can be stationary or not. So as I said before, autoregressive moving average plus integration. Integration means that you can have a unit root, okay? You can have a unit root. Um, it's good for forecasting, but it's not good to establish causality. Um, you can use unit root tests to determine the presence of unit roots. Um, then you have to use the autocorrelation function and the partial autocorrelation function to determine the lags the number of lags in the AR component and then in the MA component. This is known as the Box Jenkins methodology to, to, to estimate the RIMA model. And as you know, you have done this. If you use R, R is amazing. R has a function that um, auto RIMA, auto dot RIMA, that uh, searches among thousands of different RIMA specifications and then tells you what is the best ARIMA model. And that function is amazing. And as I have repeated to you many times in, in my lectures, the residuals must be white noise. Okay, so if the residuals are not white noise, your model is not well specified. Okay, the residuals have to be white noise because if they are not white noise, you have some kind of systematic component in the residual that should be captured by your model, okay? You should not have any kind of systematic behavior in the residuals. The residuals, they have to be white noise. If they are not white noise, you have to change your model. Our next model is the ARDL model. ARDL stands for Autoregressive Distributed Lag Model. Here we have one endogenous variable plus one or multiple exogenous variables um, as I said before, it's autoregression plus distributed lag. The variables can be stationary or not. The residuals have to be white noise. It means you cannot have any kind of systematic behavior in the residuals, including a unit root. Right? If you have a unit root in the residual, game over, folks. You have to choose another model. 
you have to increase the number of legs, uh, whatever, include, include more variables on the right hand side. Um, um, and then when you have this type of model, you have two ways of estimating the, um, the cointegration uh, relationship. Okay, you can use the Johansson test as before. So if you choose to do the Johansson test, you do the Johansson test before you estimate the ARDL model, but there's another option. And if you look at my R code on Moodle, you can see that there is a way to test for cointegration together with the ARDL model. Okay, you can take a look at how this is done just by reading the instructions that I have in my R code for time series that is available on Moodle. Okay. Uh, R can plot the impulse response functions for this model too. The problem with this type of model is that the individual coefficients that you estimate are very difficult to interpret. Okay, When you learn econometrics, um, like when you take econometrics or applied QE or QE uh, quantitative economics, you learn how to interpret the coefficients. So you you know first you look, you know is the model like linear linear or linear log or log linear? Then you have to know the units in which the variables are measured, and then you can interpret you know like a ten percent change in this variable affects the other by whatever. Uh, yeah, it changes the other one by this amount. But this is very difficult with the ARDL model. And one of the reasons is because you have the endogenous variable on the right-hand side, but lagged. So you have lagged endogenous variables on the right-hand side. So the variable that appears on the left-hand side also appears on the right-hand side, but lagged. And when you have that, and when you have other variables in levels and then in differences and then lags of levels and lags of differences, which happens with this model, this type of model, the RDL model, it's very difficult to, to understand what each individual coefficient uh, means. Okay. Um, so what we do, you have to do this. You have to plot the, the impulse response functions, okay, as I do in my R code for time series. Um, again, the residuals have to be. Oh, sorry, this. Uh, sorry, it's a typo. I just noticed the um, the the sentence is repeated. It doesn't matter. Okay, it's um, it's just to make it. It's just to make the same point again. The residuals have to be white noise. Um, next, the var model, VAR, vector autoregressive model. So now we have multiple endogenous variables. Um, so variables are regressed on past values of themselves and on contemporaneous and past values of the other endogenous variables. So here every variable is endogenous. Okay. Um, but there is a problem because the structural var cannot be estimated directly. And this is a problem. Okay. And the reason is. Um, it's because the structural errors in the structural var are not observed. They are not directly observed. Okay, um, and th this is known as the problem of uh, simultaneity. Okay, the endogenous variables are determined together at the same time, and this is a problem. This is a problem in econometrics. It happens with um, uh, cross-section models, panel data. Um, so we have to get around it, okay? Um, so what is the solution? The easiest solution is you estimate a reduced form var. Then you have to use the Cholesky triangular decomposition to recover the structural errors from the reduced form residuals, okay? Then you can plot the impulse response functions, IRFs, to understand how the system would evolve over time. But remember, this is very important, okay? Um, the, impulse the impulse response functions, they rely on the structural var, okay? Not the reduced form var. So you, you estimate the reduced form var, then you apply the Cholesky decomposition to find the structural errors, to find the structural var. When you have the structural var after the Cholesky decomposition, then you can plot the impulse response functions, which means that the impulse response functions are sensitive to the Cholesky decomposition. Okay, I'm going to drink some water here. 
getting dry. Um, and as before, the residuals have to be white noise, okay? Because if they're not white noise, your model is not well specified. The variables have to be stationary. Um, and the grandeur causality test does not work if the variables have unit roots. Okay, why? Because the grandeur causality test is an F-test. You're testing for the significance of the lagged values. The joint significance, okay? It's an F-test. It's the joint significance of the test value. And remember, we call it grandeur causality test, but in terms of substance, the grandeur causality test is not a causality test. It's a prediction test, okay? If one variable can predict the behavior, behavior of the other. And then we call it causality, but it's actually a prediction test. So it's grandeur prediction test. But it's an F-test, okay? And remember, this is... I don't know if you remember this from your econometrics class, but uh, you can only do F-tests if you have stationary data, okay? If the data is not stationary, the F-test, um, yeah, is, is useless, okay? So if you have a unit root, you cannot do an F-test. You have to remove the unit root, then you can do an F-test. Mm. And remember, this is more advanced, but that's how it works, okay? Um, there is a way to check for grandeur causality if your variables have unit roots. It's a grandeur causality test, but it's a modified one, and it's known as the as the Toda Toda Yamamoto causality test. Okay, so that's a modified grandeur causality test for unit uh, for series that have unit roots. So basically what you do, you control for one extra leg, so you determine the amount of the the number of optimal legs using the the criterion that you want, and a queen or a kaiki or Schwartz, the Schwartz criterion, and then you say, okay, the optimal number of legs is five. What you do in the Toda Yamamoto, you add one leg, so you run the var in levels with the variables with the unit roots and you add one extra leg so instead of having five legs you have six legs and then you check you do an f test to check for the significance of the lagged val uh, values okay that's that's the Toda Yamamoto which is a gradual causality test but again it's a prediction test um, so if you have a var model, the variables should not be cointegrated, okay? If the variables are cointegrated, if you do the Johansson test and you reject that r is 0, so r is 1, it means that it, the variables are cointegrated. So you cannot use the var. Why? Because you have to include the error correction EC, the error correction term, and then inside your var. So when you include the error correction term inside the var, you have the vec model, okay? The vector error correction, which is our next model, the vector error correction. So the VEC model is the VAR plus the EC term, okay, for cointegration, error correction term for cointegration. Again, if the, as I said before, so if the Johansson test rejects the null hypothesis of no cointegration, then you have to include, well, you must, you must include the error correction term in your VAR model, which means that you are actually estimating a VAC model. Uh, Contegration means that variables share a common trend. Okay, and trend, remember, trend means long-run behavior. Okay, when we're talking about trends, we're talking about the long-run behavior of the, of the time series. Um, so if you have cointegration, it means there is a self-correction mechanism that brings the time series back into a stable long-run equilibrium. The stable long-run equilibrium is exactly the same as the shear common trend, okay? Trend long-run, common trend, it means they have some kind of self-correction mechanism over the long run. You can also plot the impulse response functions uh, to see how the system evolves over time. Uh, but again, the VEC, the VEC model has the same problem as the VAR model. 
which is you cannot observe directly, you cannot directly observe the structural uh, VAC model. You cannot observe directly the, the you cannot directly observe the, the structural errors. So what do you do? You have to estimate the reduced form VAC. Then you have to use the Cholesky triangular decomposition to recover the structural errors. Uh, the residuals have to be white noise, otherwise the model is not well specified. Okay, um, so it's the same as the VAR. Okay, I'm gonna drink more water because I'm thirsty. Sorry, guys. Um, but is that okay? So next, let's move on to the panel. Uh, data models. I'm gonna compare them. Um, so look, the first thing I, I mentioned this in the first section when we were talking about the different data structures. Um, so first you have the difference, right, between uh, pooled data, pooled cross sections, and panel data. Here I'm supposing you have panel data, okay? So that's an assumption. You have panel data and you could run a panel data model. The first question that you need, need to ask yourself is should I run a panel data model? And the answer is not always yes. It's possible that even though you have panel data you're not going to estimate a panel data model because you could estimate a pooled OLS model. Okay, it's possible for you to have panel data and not to run a panel data model. And there's a reason for that, and I'm going to explain to you why that is the case. Uh, sorry for my nose, folks. My nose is completely blocked. <laughs> um, so look, before I go on with the presentation, let, let's just get this clear. So here I put pooled OLS versus unobserved effect model. So what is the difference? Pooled OLS means the first one, okay? Pooled OLS means you have panel data, okay? The data is in panel format, but you're not using a panel model. You're just going to pull the data and not going to use the the um, what we call unobserved effect okay if we're gonna say why if you decide to run a panel data model with your panel data then you're gonna have to choose between the many unobserved effects uh, models okay you have fixed effects random effects you can have GMM generalized method of moments you can have uh, many more feasible GLS, G, weighted, G, uh, weighted list squares, you can have um, and, and many different estimators, the within estimator, the between estimator, like the, there are many options, all right? So, but let's just get the language clear first, okay? So, if you have panel data and you don't run a panel data model, you're doing the pool OLS. But if you have panel data and you do a panel data model estimation, you're going to use a panel data model. Panel data model means this, unobserved effect model, okay? So let's now move to step one. So first thing that you need to do, you need to test for the poolability of the data across individuals and time, okay? If you look at my R code for uh, panel data that is available on Moodle, you're going, you can scroll down and then you're going to see that there is a section for uh, poolability tests. I give you two uh, poolability tests. So you can test this. Should I pull the data and run the pooled OLS or not? Or, okay. Um, so in fact, in terms of substance, it means, you know, you're testing whether or not you should use a panel model. If the data can be pulled, then use a pooled OLS model. No need for a panel model. If the data should not be pooled, then use the unobserved model for panel data. When the data cannot be pooled, that means that the data contain enough heterogeneity among the individuals. 
And when I say individuals, I'm not talking about people. Right? In econometrics, individual means the, the unit. So you can call it the unit, the individual, the group. You know, it could be a country, it could be a city, it could be a person, it could be a household, it could be um, a company. So when I say individuals, don't think about people, persons. Think about units, like it could be yeah, cities, countries, okay? Um, and because in the test for pullability, it says you cannot pull the, I mean, you should not pull the data, it means that there is individual heterogeneity, and this heterogeneity cannot be discarded. So you have to run a panel data model. Why? Because the test says the data contain enough heterogeneity among the individuals. So this heterogeneity cannot be discarded. So the individual component needs to be modeled. The individual component is the... It's, this is the heterogeneity, okay? It means there is... Each individual, each group has a group effect that you cannot discard because it contains uh, valuable information. So you have to use a panel data model. And then in the second test, you have to estimate this individual heterogeneity. You have to actually estimate this from the data, okay? You have to estimate the individual component. So you have to choose a model, okay? The, the two most common models are the fixed effects um, model and then the random effect model, okay? So let's start with the fixed effects model. So this is the same as the, you can call it individual dummy variables, OLS model, or, I mean, the official term is this one, list squares dummy variable model, okay? So what it does, it says the following, look, each individual, each unit, all right, not, not, not people, each, each unit has, is going to have its, its own intercept. And how do you create one intercept for each individual. Well, you have to create a dummy for each individual. And remember, the dummy is going to work as, as, as an individual intercept. So each, each individual that is observed over time in the panel data is going to have its own dummy. And this dummy is how you control for the individual effect. Okay, so this dummy, these intercepts, uh, can control for the group effects, for the time effect, or both at the same time. If you're including both, both means group and time effects, you can just call it two-way effects. Okay, two-way effects means group and time effects together. So you have dummy variables for the group, for the individuals, or... Oh, sorry, and you have yeah, and you have dummies for the time. Okay, you have dummies for the years and dummies for each country. So you're controlling for the time effects and the country effects. Um, yeah, that's what I said before. The individual intercepts capture the individual heterogeneous heterogeneous uh, fixed effects. In the FE model, FE for fixed effect. In the fixed effect model. The, the individual effects are correlated with the explanatory variables. And this is the main, let's say, um, this is the main characteristic of, of a fixed effect model, okay? This is the difference between fixed effect model and the random effect. Because here, these dummy variables here are correlated with the other explanatory, the independent variables. Explanatory means independent variables, okay? It means that, that the independent variables on the right-hand side of the regression are correlated with the dummies that you are creating for the individual effects and the time effects. Okay. In the, in the random effects model, this is not the case. The correlation is zero. Okay, we're going to see that. Um, and, and you can see this. You can, you can use the... You can use the, the exercises, I mean, the examples that I put 
in the R code for Pano data on, on, on Moodle. The, the regression, sometimes, you know, the regression coefficient coefficients that are not significant in pooled, oh, sorry, there's a typo here. It's not pooled, it's pooled double O. Well, I'm sorry, I'm gonna correct this. So it's pooled, okay? So regression coefficients that are not significant in pooled OLS can become significant in, in panel data estimations with fixed effects and random effects. The idiosyncratic error has to be white noise, again, otherwise the model is not well specified. Now let's take a look at the random effects model. As I said before, this is the opposite of the fixed effect, okay, the opposite. Because in, in the fixed effect model we had correlated and now it's not correlated. So in the random effect model, RE, the individual effects are not correlated with the explanatory variables. So the, the individual effects are treated as random. And there's a specific component in the error term for group or time or both heterogeneity, okay? The heterogeneous individual effect. Um, the individual specific component is random, uncorrelated with the regressors. The regressors are the, uh, the independent variables on the right hand side. Um, yeah, that's what I said before. The unobserved effects are uncorrelated with the regressors, just another way of putting it. Um, random effects require preliminary estimations in a two step process. Uh, the difficult part is once you estimate the RE model, the random effects model, and you can do this like in one second in R, okay? Um, uh, the implementation is very easy. R does this for, for you in one second. Um, and R can compare different models with different specifications for you very, very quickly. The problem is that the interpretation of individual coefficients is very difficult because you are controlling for within group and between group effects, okay, because of this, you know, of what I told you before. So you're controlling for this. So then the contribution of the other variables, the explanatory variables, are already filtered, like it's netted out, okay. This is what happens in econometrics. Because you're controlling for the between, ef the between group effects and the within group effects, the contribution of the other variables is after netting out the between group effects and the within group effects. And how do you select which model? Okay. Um, it's, yeah, I'm going to give you some pointers or, you know, how do you know which model you're going to use? RE or FE? Um, sorry. So first, residuals have to be white noise, otherwise the model is not well specified. So what does it mean? It means, you know, you cannot have serial correlation in the residuals. Serial correlation means autoregression, okay? So it's correlation over time. Um, so if there, if there is, if there is autocorrelation in the serial correlation, autocorrelation, or autoregression, it's the same. In the residuals, then, then the model is not good. You cannot have heteroscedasticity, so the, the, the variance has to be constant. Otherwise, you have to change the, the model. You have to use feasible GLS, okay, but this is more advanced. I'm not going to cover this now, but this is what happens. If you have heteroscedasticity, then you have to use feasible GLS feasible generalized least squares. One way, I mean, one thing that you can do is to use the Hausman test to choose between the fixed effect and random effect models. Um, remember, the null hypothesis is, always look at the null hypothesis, okay? The null hypothesis is the random effect model is consistent and should be preferred. The alternative hypothesis is um, RE is not appropriate, and then you should use fixed effects. Then you have to look at the p-value, okay? So you know if you reject or not uh, the null hypothesis. Um, in practice, what happens is that most econometricians would just use the fixed effect model, okay? In practice, 
people don't look much at the Hausman test they just run the fixed effect model because it's it's usually it's it's better to interpret the you can it's easier to interpret the the, the coefficients and the the variables okay but this is one way but in practice the Hausman test is not that indicative um, So as I said before, if you have panel data, probably you're using dummy variables to control for the individual or group effects. Okay, individual and group is the same. You know, just think about countries or cities or or companies. Uh, so you're controlling for the individual effects, for the time effects, or both at the same time. So you have individual and time effects. You can just call it two-way effects. Um, so when you control for both of them. Uh, it becomes very difficult to, to interpret the estimates. When I say yeah, the estimates, I mean the estimates of the independent variables, the regressors, okay, not the dummy variables themselves. I'm talking about the the, the independent variables on the right hand side. It's difficult to understand the contribution of each individual um, coefficient. So in practice, what we do is uh, we look at whether or not the, um, the explanatory variables have significant effects we look at the t-tests okay um, after we control for the individual and time effects so this is what people do in practice most of them would just run a fixed effect model and then you look at the significance of the variables and then you make sure that the residuals are white noise okay um, that's it folks uh, if you have questions you can email me um, I'm happy to answer them if something is not clear, but I really, um, I really want to wish you, wish you good luck in the exam. It's the last thing that you have to do for my, my, my class, and it was a pleasure meeting all of you. It was a pleasure teaching you. I wish you the best in your careers. I hope econometrics is gonna be helpful to you. You can find a better job by you know by learning all these things so make sure that econometrics is in your cv and that programming in r is in your cv in the skill section you must you must put this in your cv that you can code in r you can do advanced econometrics in r okay this class is going to help you a lot in the job market and help you to get a better job and get a uh, a job that has a higher salary okay and you can learn a lot about economics with all of this so again it was a pleasure um, teaching you for for the past weeks um, it was a pleasure to me a pleasure to meet you and I wish you all the best in your careers in your careers in your life and also in the exam all right uh, bye bye folks